Good morning, everyone. Um, we're here to talk about trees of spring. Um, I'm Michelle, and this is Doug. Um, we're going to be doing this for about an hour. Um, if you guys are willing, um, I'd like to take you on a little field trip after we're done through here and show you some other trees that we have. Um, we've kind of changed some stuff around. Um, I'm sure you've noticed uh, we put all the fruit trees on one side of the wall um, and the first two rows. Um, we moved some of the bigger shade trees so they're not stuck underneath that wall. Up where the fruit trees were so it fits a lot better and the trees are a lot happier um, that way so if you're not seeing what you're looking for please ask one of us or we'll show we'll be happy to show you where everything is um, we have gotten most of the, the majority of our trees in for the spring um, we will be bringing a few more in just to kind of restock and stuff but the majority of them are in so um, Hopefully we can help you out as far as what you're looking for. And before we get into trees, I just wanted to follow up on, Ken showed us that pampas grass. And um, it's, one of the things that's nice about it is that the long shoots that come up, the plumes with all that silk, that doesn't really happen until around September. So when you say you've been, you've had, you know, success with your yard, but a lot of the flowers are maybe winding down because we're nearing fall, all of a sudden, these shoots come out in the yard and they really last most of the winter. I was looking at my pompous grass yesterday. They're ready to be pruned. You know, they, you know, two feet of snow kind of did them in. They were ready to be cut back. But the whole idea that we talk about often is having something going on in your yard all the time, not just everything in April or May. So all of a sudden, September, you get these big shoots. And the rest of the year, you have what you saw there is this nice green mound and it's, it's attractive, blows in the wind and so on. But we're talking about trees today, so go ahead, Michelle, where do you want to start? Um, let's start, basically this is going to be a show and tell class, um, but uh, in order to be successful planting here, there are a few steps to take in order to plant a tree. So we're going to just kind of go over those real quick. Um, we also plant trees for you, so I don't know if anybody's tried to dig a hole in this ground. Um, yes. it, it's very, very difficult. But we have two big strapping guys that can come out um, and do it for you, and they have no problem whatsoever. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, we'll be happy to do that for you. Um, if you're going to do it yourself, if you decide on a smaller one or you know something like that, um, you always want to dig your hole three times as big as the bucket that it's in. Um, so like this guy, you're looking at a 40-inch hole wide. Um, you want to go just as deep as it's sitting in the ground right here and then um, you can make it a bowl shape. It doesn't have to be 12 inches all the way across. Just kind of make a nice bowl shape. Uh, shape. Um, I usually use a wheelbarrow and take all the dirt out um, uh, and mix it with mulch. So you want to go two-thirds natural soil to one-third mulch. Um, these trees really need to get used to growing in our nasty soil. Um, whether it's clay, uh, whether you, you're rocky. Um, if you are in a clay spot or have, are kind of up here, thumb mute and stuff, I would definitely recommend uh, what we call a perk test. Can you want to tell them about that? Yeah, perk test means that. When you, you've identified a spot where you want to plant your tree, let's say, and you, so you dig the hole according to the dimensions that Michelle mentioned, and then you fill that hole with water. And by the end of the day, or at the latest, the next day, that hole should, there should be no water left in there. If there is water left in there, it means that you probably don't have very good drainage and you might want to consider another spot. Yes, sir. When your guys come out, they don't do that. No. Uh, her question was, is it, if our guys come out, do we do a perk test? No, we kind of leave that to you. Um, usually, if, if they find trouble, if they hit bedrock, they'll discuss it with you and say, hey, I think we need to move a little bit this way. 
um, or maybe we should just move it to a different spot altogether. Um, so kind of getting an idea of what, what your soil is like. If you have a lot of clay, you probably want to go a little bit more heavy on the mulch uh, just to break that up originally. Um, gypsum's really good about helping break that up in the soil. Humic acid, uh, soil activator uh, is another good one that'll help break up that clay. Uh, it doesn't happen instantly, so you just have to kind of keep it, you know, keep applying and, and adding to it. I think about the perk test uh, a couple years ago, a gentleman came in and said, I took your advice, I dug the hole, put the water in there, nothing happened, it stayed in there. The next day it was still there, the next day it was still there, so he said, I thought maybe I would just, you know, get some trout and stop it and turn it into a fishing hole, but, but he decided, it was a good thing, he decided it could need, the, the tree needed to be planted somewhere else. It's not that unusual to have a little pocket of clay over here and, and maybe good soil in other parts of the yard. My sister-in-law who lives in Granville has trees that are growing like crazy, but one spot where nothing ever did very well, she asked me to kind of troubleshoot it, so I pulled out this dead plant and it was just dripping root balls dripping with water and had a wall of clay. So that's one of the challenges of, of uh, growing here is that uh, if, you, if you have soil, it's probably not very good, and so you have to work on amending it. So the question is about the process. If our crew comes out to uh, plant a tree, shrub, whatever it is, we give you the rundown. They'll, they'll, they'll dig the hole, then they'll put the mulch in, according to the, the ratio that uh, Michelle talked about. They'll you know, plant the tree and stake it as well. And we have some heavy duty lodgepole pine stakes. Then they'll put in some fertilizer and also put in a root and grow. So it's a lot more than just plopping it in the ground. Basically, they don't want to come back out and have you hear you say, well, this tree isn't doing very well. They do everything they can to get them off to a good start. So that's but, all included in the price that that's included right. in the planting price. And then price. you get a two year 50-50 right. uh, warranty on the tree. And um, so if something happens, we want you to take pictures, bring them in, uh, bring us a twig. Um, a lot of it is uh, watering issues, whether we find out that you have a clay site or you know, you're watering too much or not enough. Um, we usually try to work through it. Sometimes it's grubs. Um, so there's a lot of troubleshooting that we will go through um, in order to try to get the right answers for you. And then if something does happen to that tree, we will come out and replace it for free. So we go half on the material and then we replace it for free. And just to follow up on your question, yesterday I ran into someone, a neighbor, who uh, he bought a, a locust tree a while ago, I helped him, and he, he came up to me and he said, I just want to tell you that um, your, your guy in the planting crew, I think it was Will, he was just phenomenal. You know, he did a great job digging. He pointed out that there was some clay in the soil. Big surprise, right? Uh, and so they added a little more mulch. And then he said, "Okay, I'm, because of the weather now, I'm going to water this. It's probably good for for two weeks, and then maybe you can turn the drip back on or bring it out with the hose." So, uh, according to this fellow Mike, the customer, it, it was very very helpful experience and. Uh, you know, our guys are trained professionals, they're not, not just kids on a summer job or anything like that. They, they know what they're doing and they, uh, they feel quite strongly about it. They want to make sure that your tree uh, gets off to a good start and it's something that's going to thrive. That's, I mean, that's part of our goal here is to help people have you know, a successful gardening experience. And I'd much rather have you come in and tell us about how nice things are going uh, rather than how you're having problems. Not that we, you know, we can troubleshoot problems, and as Michelle said, a lot of times it's water. But uh, nevertheless, it's, it's, uh, it's like the complete service, you know, when they come out, it isn't just plop it in the ground. Um, want to talk about trees now? Sure. Okay. Um, let's start with the one that's right next to Doug. Um, this pink one here. Um, it is a peach tree, it's a white, uh, snow white, or snow beauty white peach. Um, all the peach trees have a gorgeous, beautiful pink flower, so um, great ornamental tree. Uh, they're gonna, if, if you let them grow to maximum height, they will get between 15 and 20 feet. Um, 
if you don't, you want to be able to pick the fruit, you can definitely top them when you, you know, when they get to 10, 12 feet. Um, and that, that's if the case with all fruit trees. We'll go down your side and then we'll... Okay, so then the next tree is a pluot, and that's a combination of a plum and mm -hmm. a apricot. apricot. Uh, I've never actually grown one of these, or even, I think, even eaten a fruit, so... Uh, they're actually they're really different. tasty. They're mm -hmm. really tasty. Yeah. Uh, but you do need a pollinator with that, and the Santa Rosa plum is really good for that. So uh, when you, if you're browsing through our, not only the, fr the fruit trees, which are down that way, we have charts that will tell you that what will pollinate with any particular tree. So it's kind of like a grid. So for example, if you're looking at apples and it says Fuji and you read across and maybe you want uh, Granny Smith and then you look and see if it says yes, then those two will pollinate each other. Some trees are do better with the pollinator and uh, they may not be very successful as far as bearing fruit if they don't have a pollinator. So oftentimes you need to get two trees and and if the other fruit is self-pollinating, so you can take a look at the charts there and see what, what fruit trees go well together. Um, Ken, do you want us to pull them in front? Or no, I'll swing over there. That, that, that lady's hat's going to be really pretty in the shot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you could move over a couple of seats if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um. Well, so the, then... The next tree, this is not really a tree, it's a, it's a vine. It's a purpley Japanese honeysuckle. And um, a lot of vines do really well here. Uh, sometimes in the summer, I'm driving around, I'll, I'll see a uh, trunk of vine growing like over a fence in an empty parking lot. It's pretty amazing to me how they take off. They like warm weather. Um, in addition to this purple leaf honeysuckle, over there we have Hall's honeysuckle which is also a very popular plant. One of the advantages of the halls is that it's, it, it's uh, evergreen. So if you are planting vines and your goal is to achieve uh, some privacy or block out an undesirable view in your neighbor's yard, it's nice to have something that's, uh, that flowers all year long. And then. What's the last one there? Um, the last one is another peach tree, I believe. It's a, or nectarine. It's a flavor top nectarine tree. Um, it is also self fertile. Um, it does have gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. Um, so it, it's one of my favorite trees. Um, nice, sweet, juicy fruit. Um, again, it's going to get in that 15 to 20 feet tall if you just let it. Um, top it if that's what you want to do. It's fine that they're very easily, to, um, it's very easy to do that. Another thing about fruit trees is in the springtime, you know, when you start to, the fruit starts to come out, it's important that you go take a look at your branches and start to thin out the fruit. I mean, it seems a shame to pull off what looks like it's going to be perfectly good apples or peaches or whatever they might be. But in general, on a branch where if you have five or six pieces of fruit, you may want to thin that down, cull it to one or two. Uh, a friend of mine had a 20-year-old apple tree and had grown really big and he never really pruned it, it got very tall. And it was a great summer and all of a sudden it was just overflowing with apples. And one day he was out in the yard and the whole tree just, just crashed down, it just collapsed of its own weight. Uh, and so he had to get the tree service to you know, clean up all the branches, and he had just literally bags and bags of apples. So that's one of the things, once you uh, get fruit going, just thin it out, because you'll get better fruit that way anyway, and it's better for the plant. So the I see the last tree over on the right here is <laughs> autumn blaze maple. I, I love this tree. I have two of these in my yard. They're wonderful shade trees. Uh, they have a nice shape. They don't require much. I've never really even pruned them, and uh, they they have a beautiful orange reddish leaves in, in the fall. And uh, another thing that's good about them is that their leaves these leaves are really hardy. So when the wind picks up, which is probably going to fairly soon, 
these leaves don't get shredded. Sometimes folks will come in with a branch from a tree, and it might even be another type of maple. And we'll say, what happened? And we we'll say, well, you know this prevailing southwesterly wind that we have all the time now? That's what caused that. Autumn blaze maple, they're usually uh, pretty hardy, and the leaves will handle the wind that we've got here. Um, on that subject, um, the autumn blaze does get pretty good size. Uh, it gets in that 30, 40 foot range. Um, we do bring in uh, a couple of small maples that if you guys want to walk around, I'll show you. Um, it's called a Main Street maple. Um, same gorgeous foliage, um, but it only gets about 20, 25 feet tall and about 15 or 20 wide. So it, it's a nice uh, compact tree um, with the same colors as that. Um, just back here real quick, um, we should change this to trees and shrubs of summer. Um, lilacs are all fixing to pop right now. Um, we just, there's a whole bunch of boomerangs on the back wall in here. Uh, they just came off the truck, so we're, we're trying to protect them, protect the blooms, uh, so they will bloom for us. Um, but uh, if you're interested in the lilac, now's a great time to get them in. Um, beautiful, uh, all sort of different sizes, so depending on what size your yard is, we can, we can definitely accommodate you. Um, one of the lilacs I have back there, I have three of them, it's actually a bloomerang on a standard, so it's actually a tree. Um, so it has a, a rootstock and then it has the bloomerang shrub on top of it. So it's going to be a small ornamental tree, um, probably le uh, less than 10 feet um, and about probably six four to six feet wide. So it's in the very back next to the purpley uh, honeysuckle. Yes, ma'am? Is a lilac something that you can have low maintenance, let it just go if you have a spot where it can flourish? You don't have to really prune Her question is, is a lilac something that you can just let go um, if it needs maintenance or not? Um, getting it established is very important. Um, once it is established, they're pretty low maintenance. Uh, they do better if you, you know, trim off the blooms afterwards because that's where the new blooms will come from. It'll keep it thriving better. Uh, but other than that, they're, they're pretty low maintenance. Occasionally, they'll get powdery mildew, uh, especially like during monsoon season. But if you kind of hit them with either the revitalizer or the copper uh, in June, that'll help cut that back. Are they part of the firewise plant? Uh, her question was about are they firewise plants? Um, typically, your deciduous plants are more firewise than your evergreens. Um, evergreens hold that resin, is that what's in it? Mm -hmm. uh, the oils and stuff. Uh, and because they are green, they're, they're so much more combustible than deciduous. Um, so um, they, you can put them kind of close to your house, but I, I think it's just a judgment call on where you're at. Um, if you're out in the middle of uh, the prairie and you, you back to wilderness, I don't know that I put a lot of plants right next to my house. I think I'd, I'd give a workable space between it. One thing you show about the, the bloomerang that Michelle mentioned, one of its advantages is that it blooms uh, several times per year. We always talk about it blooming twice, but um, last week Ken was telling us he's had one now for several years. He got one as soon as they came out. And last summer, it bloomed three times. So lilacs are wonderful, and the traditional ones, they just bloom once in the springtime, and that's it. But the bloomerangs, if things go well, uh, they can bloom several times during the season. Maybe a spring bloom, or a rest period, you know, midsummer time bloom, maybe even fall if uh, if things go well, the weather conditions are conducive. And this one is not a tree as well either, but this is a, a red double tape orange quince. Um, nice large shrub, um, gets in the five to six foot range. Um, I was down in Mayer last uh, spring 
and they had one of these and it was just a 20 foot hedge and it was all of this and it was just green and red it was just absolutely gorgeous um, nice uh, green leaves like I said five six foot tall and wide uh, very trimmable if you want to kind of keep it a certain length um, but gorgeous gorgeous shrub <laughs> this how Ken does it. <laughs> Tell us about this one, Michelle. Um, this is a Mediterranean Heath. Um, we get these in the spring. Um, what we have down there is all we're going to get this year. Um, we used to get these from Monrovia, and they are not doing them anymore. So we've kind of been hunting them down. Uh, but we did get some in this week. Um, this is a shade plant, so it needs some afternoon uh, shade. You can go take the morning sun, but it, it needs like an east or northeast side of your house, so it has some protection. Um, these little uh, needles down here uh, will fry if you put it in the full sun. Um, it blooms for almost a, a, a good month, month and a half, um, it's kind of depending on the weather. Um, and then it's just an evergreen shrub after that so uh, about two by two um, i've seen them a little bit bigger than that but that's usually about the price and the bees do love it so i wouldn't put it right next to my door or something what's like buzzing that. around me right now <laughs> how big do they get uh two by two um this little specimen here um, i will say this is the last one um, kevin sold three of, or two of them yesterday um, came right off the truck and they were out there uh, really neat, small specimen plant. Uh, it is a French pussy, weeping pussy willow. So this is what it's going to continue to do. Um, it turns green and then it, it'll, uh, I think it turns yellow in the fall as far as the color foliage wise. Um, stays this nice small size. Occasionally you'll get a little bit up, but this is pretty much what it is. Um, Chanticleer pear, uh, this is an ornamental pear. Um, we have like five different varieties this year of ornamental pear trees. Um, the great thing about ornamental pears is that they bloom in the spring uh, and they're the last trees that turn and, and the color is absolutely gorgeous. It's a gorgeous orange, um, but they're the last trees that turn colors and drop. So after all your other like maples and all that stuff drops their leaves, these guys still hold them. So a uh, really nice tree. Chanticleer's the skinnier one. Um, the Bradford, the aristocrat, they all get pretty good white width to them. Um, this one kind of stays in that 15, 20 range. So it's, it's a nice skinnier tree. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, her question was, is this a wheat tree? Um, I've heard that question a lot uh, with all our newcomers that are coming through. Um, because we don't get the, except for last month, um, typically we don't get the heavy snows uh, that other places do. Um, these guys hold up very well. Um, even in our, our strong winds that we have come through here, they, they hold up really well. Um, they are an ornamental tree, so they don't, if you get fruit, it's going to be tiny, tiny, and the birds are going to eat it before it starts dropping. So, and as far as the pear tree goes, I've got two of these in my yard, and as Michelle mentioned, all the other trees have lost their leaves. I picked them all up, and I'm waiting. And okay, so once the pear tree kind of drop its leaves, and it didn't drop them until I think almost December. So I have one tree that's kind of a shade tree and it has this nice, you know, dense growth and it's near the kitchen window so by the time they finally lose their leaf maybe late december it's less important that you know, the sun is not as bright as it would be in the summer and fall so you really get kind of you know a lot more for your money if you like that as a shade tree and they are wonderful shade trees never had any problems nothing has ever broken um, they look healthy right now they're flowering birds are all over and they're you know they're they're already ahead
ahead of most of the other trees in the yard this time of year. So I think they're like a great tree, whether you, you know, want to grow fruit or you prefer just an ornamental one. Um, this little guy here is a new pine tree for us. Um, it's a Japanese black pine, and it's called Thunderhead. Um, this one's kind of cool. It's going to get about 10 feet tall and 15 feet wide. Um, so it's a nice little evergreen if you need to fill a little bit of space on there. Um, there is another um, pine. It's an Arnold Sentinel pine. It's on the north side of the lower greenhouse. I think there's three or four of them um, that are smaller specimens. Um, it's a, a part of the Austrian pine family, um, but it only gets uh, in that uh, 10 to 15, I think, tall and five wide. So uh, nice skinny tree if you have a smaller area and you still want a pine tree. Is that a slow growing? So will I see it in my lifetime or will that grow a bigger? Um, her question was, is, is it a slow growing tree? Usually the, the if it is a dwarf, they're going to grow slower than, you know, the, the regular Austrian. It, it's a, one of the faster growing pine trees. Um, on the other side, the white tree, um, there is a um, Japanese beauty plum. Um, so it is a, uh, it, it's actually a red plum. Um, so the flesh in it is red. Um, it is a self pollinating plum tree. And it has pretty nice sized fruit. And then the this little guy here, please don't speak. Um, this is a crab apple. Um, this is Royal Raindrops. And the really neat thing about this guy is that he actually has purple foliage. Um, so um, instead of just a green tree, um, he has almost like a purple leaf plum uh, color on the leaves. Um, gorgeous red, kind of fuchsia flowers. And then he has that purple uh, foliage all year round. And then they kind of turn orange, purple in the fall. Um, these are mid-sized trees. They're going to be about 20 by 20. Uh, so uh, they do really well. Tell. Um, if you look around in here, uh, we have a lot of plant, uh, topiary trees. Um, they're great for smaller areas if you want a specimen piece. Uh, we've got uh, globe spruce on a standard back there. Um, they're going to get in that four to probably six foot. On so you just have this big lollipop of a blue spruce, so if you're looking for something at, like a blue spruce that doesn't get 30 feet tall, those are great ones. Uh, we also have small ones like that guy right there. Um, he's going to get in that four to six foot range, so he's a nice round shrub. Um, we also have uh, a weeping blue atlas spruce over there, or cedar, sorry, weeping blue atlas cedar. Um, that is a serpentine, um, so it's been trained. They've just kind of made curly cues on it, and it, it, it's a really neat specimen piece. Um, junipers, we've got the twisty, uh, twirly ones. Uh, we've got palms, so a lot of neat trees in this year. Um, so it. Like I said, as soon as we're finished here and answer all your questions, uh, we'll take you a little walk around and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more trees. Um, how far apart do you, if you need a pollinating tree, how far apart do you plant it? Her question was about pollinators and how far apart you want to plant them. It kind of depends on, you need to decide what size of tree you're going to have and then plant them, you know, so if you say you want it 10 by 10, I would do it every 10 feet. Um, or you can give them a little bit. As long as the tree is within 50 feet of another tree, you're going to get pollinization. 
as a general rule, tree clouds are about the same size as the canopy? Her question. Okay. The, <laughs> the question is. I'm being off. <laughs> the, uh, the root ball of a tree doesn't correspond to the, the where the drip line goes, and the answer is sometimes it, it can kind of depend on the tree. Some trees stay fairly close to uh, the drip line as far as the roots are roughly the same, but other trees like maybe cottonwoods and elms, they can have roots that are extend out way beyond the drip line. So they, it may depend on the tree. I know folks will say, well, I want to put a tree over here, but I've got my, um, yeah, I've got my leech uh, field here, that sort of thing. They want to know how far those roots are going to go. Not, you know, it's not an exact science, but generally uh, it's pretty close to what you're talking about, depending on the tree. Fruit trees, is that a general? Yeah, I think so. Isn't yeah. that fruit trees? Fruit yeah. trees, so be the same. fruit trees, you can usually figure that it's going to be uh, the roots will be about the dimension of uh, the drip line of where the branches extend. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. It's kind of about planting. So if you're planting trees and you're new to this area, and so can you correct if you have not put gypsum in, can you actually you know, substitute or top dress a tree to actually help with breaking up that clay? Yes, it can. Not so sitting in water? <clears throat> so the question about uh, can you amend the soil? Uh, can you do whatever is necessary to make sure that the tree does well? Top dressing, mulch, and uh, the answer is yes. In some cases, you, you probably you should do that. Um, when you when you first dig the hole and you maybe determine there's a lot of clay in there, maybe dig it a little bit bigger, and then as Michelle said, a little bit heavier on the mulch, heavier ratio, and you could put some gypsum in there to try and break up that clay. But as time goes by, you can also use the mulch as a top dressing. It's basically organic matter. You know, it's like a form of compost. So you can sprinkle that on the top, and uh, you know, rain will wash it in, that sort of thing. And um, it's, you probably could do that on a regular basis if you think that this is kind of a, an area where there isn't much there for the tree in terms of uh, soil nutrients. And I. I have found that the humic acid or the soil activator works really, really well. Um, I started using that last year uh, with mine, and I live out in Dewey, and I, I have rock, I have clay, and I have caliche. Um, so there's not a lot of soil, so to speak. Um, but since I've done that, I have earthworms in there, and I'm seeing a difference in, in the way my trees respond. Um, I've kind of, it, it's been very challenging living there, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, I, I've noticed a huge difference since I started using that. Are any of these uh, deer resistant? Deer resistant? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, are any of these trees deer resistant? And if they have nice, young, soft leaves and fruit, deer will eat them, maybe have a leaf. Uh, we have a whole class in that, and it, believe me, it's a challenge. I've, I've happily have sort of discovered my yard. I, I think they've always known it was there, but now it's like this this tribe of eight comes through. They stop at the neighbor's bird feeder and hop into my yard to see what they might find there. Um, and so there's a whole class of what plants you can grow that maybe will be animal resistant, but I wouldn't. I would say that. Uh, you know, deer could get up on their back legs like a dog and reach way up high in a tree. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it can be a challenge. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do for those instance. Um, definitely look for uh, trees that have a higher, um, where the canopy starts higher, that helps. Um, especially with new trees, and you, if you are in a deer area, I would definitely fence it off. Um, they think it's a new toy. Um, so if you kind of keep it from getting there originally, eventually they'll, they'll give up and, and kind of leave the tree alone. Um, but once that canopy gets up, they're usually pretty safe unless they decide to rub their horns and do that type of thing with them. Yes, ma'am? I have one of those grass things that you say that have a bloom, but uh -huh. mine aren't blooming anymore. How come? 
her, her question was, it sounds like you have a pampas grass that's not blooming. They only bloom in the, the fall. Um, so in March now, you want to cut it back. And the easiest way to cut those back is take a t piece of twine um, and tie it around it really tight. And then take your uh, trimmer and then just go And that twine's going to hold all that stuff together so you don't have to scrape and okay. all that stuff. And then just feed it. Um, and then it st should start turning green. I noticed ours were starting to turn green down at, at the front parking lot. So thank you for coming and we'll go for a walk.